Hello and welcome to the new tutorial series for Total War Three Kingdoms. Um, I had a little rethink about the way I was structuring the tutorial videos on this channel and uh, I don't think they were really doing what I wanted them to do. Um, so this is, uh, this is another crack at it and hopefully these videos will be a little bit more informative and make the game more accessible for more people. Um, the, the way these tutorials are going to be structured is essentially um, for complete beginners. Um, I will be making the assumption that you know nothing about Total War and going through everything individually. Um, for those who already do understand the basic mechanics, that might be a little bit monotonous, but uh, if you keep watching you might find out some things that you didn't know otherwise. Um, and likewise, if there's anything that you think I missed out that I should have included, or any ways that you think I could make these tutorials better, please feel free to comment and let me know. I will uh, strongly consider including it in future videos. Um, so without further ado, I think the best way to start these tutorials is probably with the recommended characters. Um, so we're going to do it faction by faction, as the, uh, the different mechanics are quite... Um, they do vary quite a lot between factions. For the purpose of the first video, we're going to be looking at Cao Cao. Now, uh, he is the first in the recommended characters, which will be up here on the top left. You can turn that off if you'd like by uh, unticking the show recommended characters box. Um, I don't really know why you'd do that other than to kind of de-junk this sidebar, because there are a lot of factions in this game. Um, you'll see initially he starts off with two generals either side of him. So you've got Cao Cao in the middle. Then there's... Uh, Xiao Hu Dun and Xiao Hu Yan. Um, the, uh, the toggle here to show map will essentially show you your starting location and also the other factions that are around you. So you've got um, in your immediate vicinity He Yi, he is one of the yellow turban remnants. We've got uh, in, in also an enemy. You've got Yuan Shu who's not particularly friendly with you either. Um, Liu Chong who Again, he's sort of new rule at the start, and then uh, Tao Tian, who you will have a, um, you'll be strongly pushed to go to war with at a certain point in the story, just to follow the romance of the Three Kingdoms story. But you aren't obligated to do that. You can uh, you can decide not to if uh, if you prefer. Uh, you do also have Liu Biao to your uh, southeast. Um, not going to be too much of an issue in the early game, but you're probably going to have to deal with them at some point. Um, the the rest of them, it will just depend on the way the game goes. The way Total War works is pretty much everything's based on chance. And um, pretty much every playthrough is a little bit different because of that. I personally really, really like that. It really improves the replayability of the game. And some really unpredictable things can happen. Um, but for the, uh, the purpose of this tutorial, we will now go over to the... Um, the character panel and the faction panel. So we've got obviously Cao Cao, his name in Chinese there, and the uh, the faction flag. We've also got his uh, character type, which is strategic mastermind. Um, his playstyle focuses diplomatic manipulation, and the starting situation is easy. I wouldn't trust this too much. Um, with a lot of the factions, I've found that the starting situation assessment by the game is not always the most accurate. Um, it's not too difficult with Cao Cao. But it's, I wouldn't necessarily say it was easy either, especially not for a beginner. So um, under the faction tab, we've got credibility, which is the faction's unique resource. Credibility represents the diplomatic respect and influence of this faction. It can be used to manipulate and influence others in diplomacy. So with Cao Cao, you have the ability to incite proxy wars. A proxy war is a war that you trigger between two other independent parties without your direct involvement as one of the war's participants. So this can be very useful if you've got too many enemies or you're just trying to keep the factions around you busy, fighting each other while you gain strength and take advantage of the aftermath. Um, that is a very, very useful mechanic in, in a lot of ways for Cao Cao's campaign and it does make sense for his character type. He's a very, in the in this story, he's a very well-known manipulator. Um, he is very, very good at manipulating situations and people to get the results that he, he wants, essentially, or to further his own ambitions. Um, the influence uh, to diplomatic relations, essentially, um, the, the relations between two factions are determined by their diplomatic attitude to one another. Good relations will mean a higher chance for constructive deals, that's trade agreements, non-aggression pacts, alliances, even vassalage in some cases, or confederation, uh, which we will go into in, in more detail. Um, and the um, it also means that war is less likely. So it doesn't necessarily rule out the, the probability of them declaring war on you altogether, um, but it does mean that they're much less likely to. 
Um, so if you if there's a particular faction that you don't want to go to war with, you might want to try and stay on their good side. Um, credibility also recovers over time, so he will gain credibility um, the longer you play on in the game. Um, and when you do things like inside proxy wars or other credibility mechanics, that will decrease it, and you'll get various buffs and debuffs through that. Um, the Tsao Tsao faction also has unique features, which are two unique types of cavalry units. We've got Tiger and Leopard Cavalry, which is Shock Cavalry, and they're available for all characters in this faction at rank 3 or higher. Um, their role is an all-rounder, and they're essentially defense versus missile. So it's with a Shock Cavalry in this game, they are very vulnerable to uh, missile attacks. So to have Shock Cavalry that's also got good defense against missile units is very, very useful. However, they do have low damage. So they're essentially like a tank Shock Cavalry unit in some ways. Um, the description of these is uh, equipped with partial iron armor and highly protective shields. These disciplined and elite cavalry hunt down enemies with armed, mis armed with missile weapons. On the other side, you've got heavy tiger and leopard cavalry, which are essentially the same sort of thing, um, but they're much more defensive and much more um, protected against mi late mid to late game units. Um, and these these um, cavalry units are available to any characters in this faction. Who are above rank six, um, so that's that's very useful as well because uh, usually with with very elite shock cavalry, there's only certain types of generals that can actually recruit them, which again we will go into when we talk about recruitment. But um, to have elite shock cavalry that you can recruit to any character is very useful. Um, we've also got the farming garrisons, which are an agricultural building chain. This means you can build it in the place of farms or in farming settlements. Um, you can probably build it pretty much anywhere, but it's going to get the most use in farming settlements. And again, that's something that will make more sense when we get into the map. So uh, this building provides food, minus military district cost and replenishment. And the description is soldiers farm the land to supply food for your armies, simultaneously defending it and increasing food yield in the area. And we've also got Teutinian conscri conscription which is a military building chain, gives you an extra starting rank for new recruits based on the level of the building, gives you extra movement range for your armies, which is very useful in the early game, and it also gives you an extra seasonal, seasonal retinue deployment. Um, again, that's something that we'll have to go into more detail on, but it's basically how many armies you can raise in a given turn, and uh, gives you extra food from farming, um, and less agricultural garrison cost. It does also harm the population growth in your in the commandery that you build it in. So it can help. It can hurt things like tax revenue and um, replenishment if you're not careful with it. Um, noteworthy characters. Again, these are the generals on either side: um, Zhao Hu Dun and uh, Zhao Hu Yan. This is a champion and a vanguard. You can tell that by the colours. We will go into a little bit more detail about that when we get into the game. Unique characters are slightly different. Cao Cao, for example, is a commander. Usually they're represented by yellow, but because he's unique, it doesn't really apply to him. Because these guys have got green on them, you know they're, they're a champion. Because these guys have got red on them, you know they're a vanguard. Um, we won't get into the different character types too much just yet, um, but we will start to, to investigate that a little bit more when we get into the game. To go over to the character panel, you can see that Cao Cao is uh, dutiful. So these are his traits, first of all. He's dutiful, ambitious, superstitious. Um, the dutiful trait, at least at the start of the game, and these, these are variable throughout the game and you can pick up different traits and lose traits depending on what you do and what happens to you in the game, as well as random chance. Um, dutiful will give him plus 8 authority and reduced penalty from desire for higher office plus 10 satisfaction. The reduced penalty for higher office isn't much of an issue for uh, Cao Cao, neither is the satisfaction because he's the faction leader, therefore he doesn't have satisfaction, uh, a satisfaction mechanic I should say. Um, the authority stat, which he has two traits that increase his authority, is the main stat for a commander. Um, and the um, the purpose of authority essentially is to, if it's a faction leader, heir or prime minister in your faction, then they will increase the satisfaction level dependent on their authority level. So the higher authority, the higher satisfaction for everybody else in the, the faction. Um, if it's just a normal general, it will only buff the, um, the morale of their particular retinue. So a retinue is a group of soldiers that are with that particular general and bound to them. And uh, the higher the authority stat, the more morale that particular group of soldiers will have. 
the um, the ambitious trait again. The uh, it gives plus five income from all sources of administrative commandery. The only thing that's really um, applicable to Tao Tsao in this particular trait is the plus eight authority, because uh, he's not going to want higher office. He's already in the highest office, and uh, he's not going to want independence as an administrator because all, all have the plus five income from all sources as an administrator. Because as the faction leader, he's not going to be administrating a commandery. Administrators are like governors essentially. He also has the superstitious trait, so uh, this one gives him plus six cunning and plus two instinct, as well as ten undercover network cost for enemy spies. Now, uh, the cunning stat essentially is most applicable to strategists, and it tends to govern archers um, and ranged units in general. Um, the way Cao Tao is in the story, it makes some sense for him to be a strategist more than a commander, really, but... The way the game represents him is as, as a commander, and he was a cavalry commander um, in in the in actual history and in the beginning of the story as well. So it makes some sense. Um, but he is nevertheless he's got a very high cunning skill, and this superstitious trait gives him even more. Um, and cunning will give you more ammunition for archers. It will also um, do various other things, which we'll get into when we start discussing the actual skills and uh, stats of your generals. Um, and again, we've discussed in, in a little bit that he is a commander class in the game, which uh, the game's description of that is that he excels at inspiring friendly troops, but weaker in melee. Best group with retinues of melee cavalry. So, um, yeah, you don't really want to be getting them to duel other generals unless it's another commander um, or some sentinels, I, I suppose. Um, commanders can be somewhat effective in duels, but not as much as, as most of the other classes. Um, he also gives minus 25% redeployment cost, minus 15% recruitment cost for cavalry, and plus two available spy positions. The spy network is something that will probably require its own video, but uh, we'll cover it as much as we can in the uh, in the context of Cao Cao in this video. Um, just before we start, we'll go through the character background. Cao Cao watches dynasties fall and tyrants rise. He has seen power slip into the hands of the undeserving, and through the chaos, plots a path back to order by his hand. Regarded as, as a strategic genius, he pursues victory at any cost. Assured that the ends will always justify the means, though some call him ruthless, Cao Cao is nevertheless mindful and considerate, maintaining agricultural garrisons to protect both his supplies and the populace during inhospitable times. Um, he's a very interesting character, Cao Cao, in the, uh, in the story. I do have a lore playlist as well, um, which goes through each of the rulers of the Three Kingdoms, Cao Cao, Liu Bei, and Sun Jian. Um, and there's quite a lot about Cao Cao's background and his position in the story, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, um, if you'd like to check it out. For the purpose of this tutorial, we will be playing on Romance mode. You do have the option to either do Romance or Records. Um, the Romance mode will basically... It's, it's a more character-centric Total War Battle experience is how it's described. That's a pretty good description, to be honest. Pretty much everything depends on your characters and your generals. Um, under Romance, we have generals ride into battle as single powerful warriors who use larger-than-life abilities inspired by their feats in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Adds a parallel layer of character versus character combat in which generals must take bold action to prevent enemy characters from devastating friendly units or from effectively supporting their own. To this end, generals are also able to engage each other in heroic duels as battles rage on around them. As characters increase in rank, they will become increasingly resilient. What once would have killed them will only wound them. And the records mode is essentially... It's more like a, a true-to-history version of the uh, events. And it's its more familiar probably to uh, other people that have played other Total War games outside of maybe Warhammer, uh, where you do tend to have quite powerful generals. Um, but this uh, essentially records mode is... To me, not really what the romance of the Three Kingdoms is all about. So we will be playing on uh, we will be playing on romance, and uh, on the battle difficulty. Instead of setting it to legendary, which is what I did in the first set of tutorials, we are going to set it to normal because it's probably a good starting point. Easy is a bit too easy. Maybe for a complete beginner, it, it may be worth starting it on easy. But for the time being, for this tutorial, we're going to do it on normal, and we're also going to take off battle realism. So we're we're going to be able to pause and look around in the battle. Um, I'm going to change the advisor help to high, just so that we've got that um, complement in the tutorial. Um, and we're going to set no limit on battles. 
we are going to show all of the AI player moves, which basically shows you what the computer is doing between turns, um, or what the AI is doing between turns, I suppose. Um, the time of day will leave to default. Timeless characters just stops your characters aging and dying of old age. I prefer to leave this off, to be honest with you. I like my characters to die at a reasonable age, even if it's somewhat detrimental. I can understand why some people like to have this on. Um, it can be a little bit frustrating when you raise a character to the highest possible level and make them as strong as you possibly can and then they just die of old age in the next turn. Um, but me personally, just for immersion purposes, I do prefer to leave this unchecked. So feel free to do with that as you will. Um, this is the setting we're going to be using. and We're going to start at uh, Rise of the Warlords, which is essentially the start of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, just after Dom Juo, um essentially kidnaps the Emperor and uh, the warlords in the coalition start to rise to uh, take down him and they start to gain ambitions of emperorship themselves and decide to try and overthrow the Han. So we're, uh, we're essentially going to start there. Dong Zhuo seizes the young emperor and we will begin the campaign. The flames have run their course. Luo Yang is nothing but rubble now. It is the work of the tyrant Dong Zhuo, who now wields power unchecked. He absconds with the Emperor in tow. He is barbaric, but not altogether unwise. As long as he controls the court, he controls the Empire. In peace, I shall be an able subject. In chaos, a crafty hero. What of the Coalition, my lord? They have... The Coalition is finished. They have lost their bite. But perhaps they can be rallied into something resembling their old strength. It seems that I must be the blade of China's justice. There is no other who can. Man's span of life, whether long or short, depends not on heaven alone okay so after that lovely introduction we're now greeted with a mission um, we are told to establish our power lord Cao Cao, you have been cast out branded an enemy of the empire it's clear that only you have the capability to end dong Zhuo's tyranny and bring peace you can use the surging population and pliable peasantry of your homelands to take your advantage whilst vulnerable foes to the north may make expansion there beneficial. The time has come to increase your prestige and influence, then unite what has been divided. Now the, uh, actually my mistake, this is not necessarily a mission, it's basically just a, a little uh, set in the scene of uh, Cao Cao's faction. Um, it's telling you to be wary of Yuan Shu to the west and Tao Chen to the east, and claim the neighbouring Han Empire regions. So. We will uh, left click to close the current window. Now we've got a mission. So, um, pursued by Dong Zhuo's men, Cao Cao prepares to fight. The coalition is finished and the tyranny of Dong Zhuo endures. Despite your intentions, the time has now come to look to other plans. Although you've returned home, there is little time to waste. The tyrant has sent Han forces to apprehend you. They must be defeated before we can look to our future. The objective here is to engage the enemy army. Left click to select your army, then right click on the enemy force to initiate a battle. Again, you've got the objectives here, engage the following enemies, sorry, the following general's army in a battle, which is Yuan Huan, and uh, if you wanted to know where he was, you can do that, and it will zoom right in on him. The reward on success is a taste of victory, which will give us, for three turns, 30 military supplies, faction-wide, and plus five morale, faction-wide as well. The description there is, keep your forces supplied and your men will thank you. It, it, there's a funny story about Cao Cao with uh, supplies actually, which we will get to in the lore series. He's a, he's a brilliant character, he really is. Let's uh, let's exit that. Now, we've got this little flashing icon here on uh, Cao Cao's face. That's because we've put the advisor um, help to high, so it will literally try and help you with everything. Um, we're not going to engage this general just yet. Um, to anyone who wants to know how I zoomed out there, I literally just used the mouse wheel. You can use that to zoom in or out. Um, the pins that we've got here will 
give you some indication of interests on the map. So here we've got Cao Cao um, in a little quote for him as well. Um, we also have a pin up here, which is Huang Xiao. That is one of the yellow turban remnants who will be like a likely enemy. Um, and we've also got He Yi, which we discussed at the beginning as well, um, who is also a, one of the yellow turban remnants who will be a likely enemy. And we've got the coalition. As planned, Yuan Xiao has failed to maintain the coalition. Now is the time for me to rise up and unite the warlords. So that's just setting the start, essentially, and giving you some idea of where Cao Cao's place in this story is when you start this campaign in Rise of the Warlords. So, uh, before we go any further, there are some things, quite a few things actually, on this screen um, that we need to discuss. We'll start at the top left. We've got the season and turn number up here. So we're in Harvest 190, which is the start date of the Rise of the Warlords campaign, which is essentially the main game. And we're at turn one, you'll see there, um, beside the little green, which will change based on the season, of course. Because we're in Harvest, it's green, and that's uh, telling us that we're in turn one. And it says, each of the five seasons affects the land and battles in different ways. Um, underneath that, we've got the treasury, or our gold. Uh, so we've got 3,000 at the minute, that's represented in white. And then we've got 1,653 expected to come in next turn. If you look at the information on the treasury, you can see that we've got 3,000 from family estates, 159 coming in from taxation, and we've got 1.2 thousand army upkeep and th minus 300 salary. So the um, the bottom there as well is expected 1.7 change this turn um, and 3k current. So it's, it's basically rounding that up and saying we're expected to get 1,700 next turn. We can see a, a more detailed um, description of this if we click on the treasury itself, but we will get to that in a little while once we've discussed the basic interface on uh, on the beginning screen. So underneath your gold, you've got your food, and that will tell you that you've got plus five income from peasantry because that's effectively foods linked to peasantry income in some ways in this game, and it'll give you plus two reserves in all of your commanderies. Now the reserves, if we click on Chen, for example, are down here. And the reserves will effectively, they will buff you military supplies. Military supplies are this bar here. The brown with the green. The brown is how many supplies you've got now. And the green is the expected change this turn. We'll go into them a little bit more when we talk about armies. But at the minute, all we need to know is that food. The amount of food or surplus food that you've got affects the amount of reserves you have. And the reserves are useful for your military supplies and also for holding out against the siege. So, for example, if we weren't here and this army came up and laid siege to this city, they would be able to hold out against that siege for six turns. And you can see that there with the little trebuchet icon. It says the capital of this commandery can hold out in a siege for six turns. Um, that can be useful um, if you've only got one army or a small force and you need to get them over to uh, somewhere where the AI is laying siege to reinforce. Um, usually reserves are not something that's really worth paying that much attention to. If the AI attacks your city, it's usually because they think they can take it fairly soon. So uh, it can be handy to know that, it, but you're probably not going to get too much use out of it. Um, so that's the main function of food, is your, um, your, your military supplies and your reserves. And of course, if the reserves run out, the public order will then be affected and you'll have all kinds of problems. You want this to be at least zero. Zero means you're breaking even. You're producing enough food to distribute to all of your people. Um, if you can get a surplus on it, that's great. And it is somewhat useful in diplomacy as well, which we'll discuss when we get into diplomacy. Um, for now, that's pretty much all you really need to know about food. We'll just go through the game's definition of it as well. Food is a key resource generated by specific buildings such as farms and fisheries. It can also be obtained through diplomatic trading. Food shortage across your territories will lead to local reserves being depleted. This will reduce military supply, recovery for your armies, and can cause public order issues. Pretty much what I've just said. To be honest, I might as well have just read that <laughs> if I had half a brain. Um, so we've got um, resources underneath the food. That is telling you what resources we currently have available to trade. It is possible to get a trade agreement with other factions without having any other resources. Uh, at the minute, we actually have not, and we can't get into diplomacy this turn, just because it's turn one, and we need to take this army out. Well, I should rephrase that. You can do diplomacy on turn one, but right now we need to take this army out before we can do anything. 
Um, so we, we've discussed essentially these mechanics on the side. Um, we've now got the faction summary. So if we go ahead and click that, this will bring us into the, believe it or not, the faction, faction summary screen. Um, it will tell us our new, unique features and buildings, which is what we saw on the beginning of the screen. Um, here we've got the, you'll have the portrait of the faction leader, of course, which may not always be Cao Cao if he dies or leaves the faction for whatever reason. Um, you've got here a chain of different titles that you can accrue, or ranks, I suppose, is more accurate. At the minute we're a noble, and we earned this year, earned this rank in the year 190. Um, it tells you that it's your current rank. We are on our way to second markets. And second markets will give us a ton of boosts. We've, we need an additional 46 prestige to reach this rank. We will go into prestige in more detail as the tutorial goes on. Um, you can increase your prestige by capturing and expanding settlements or by constructing special buildings. The function or the buffs that we get from being second Marcus as opposed to Noble is plus two credibility, which is the faction unique mechanic. Armies provided three, so we can get up to three armies. Assignment slots provided two. We'll go into assignments in more detail. Administrators provided one. Again, administrators we covered in short in the beginning. They're like governors, essentially, of, uh, of different commanderies. And they're commanderies like a province or a county. Um, so we get an extra one of them. Uh, we can do an extra trade agreement. We get another spy position. We can uh, adjust faction-wide tax levels and unlock diplomatic option to create coalitions with other factions. So that's nice. It, in it unlocks a lot of different features and uh, things that might be might be useful to us and you tend to get more and more of these as you go up the ranks most of them are just scalable um, and ranking up does provide other benefits as well um, you get access to more elite units and things like that as you'd probably expect from a strategy game like this um, as you rank up you basically get more of and more powerful versions of the things that you've already got so for example we've got one available trade agreement at second marcus if we were to move to marcus we can have two available trade agreements same goes for administrators etc there are some unique things that happen as you rank up um, we'll discuss those a little bit more when we go into the prestige system and the ranking system as well but for now it's it's safe to say really as you rank up you'll just get bonus things that you already have if that makes sense um, on the right hand side, we've got a summary and statistics panel. Now uh, we'll stick to the summary for now. And this is more or less a more in detail version of what we saw at the top left hand side of the screen in terms of your money and food and everything. So we'll go down um, each option categorically and see uh, what everything means and what everything does. So we've got, um, first of all, the faction is Cao Cao for the time being. When a faction is Noble, Second Marcus, or Marcus, they will. The faction itself will take the name of the ruling warlord. So whoever the faction leader is, until you reach the, the rank of duke, will be the name of the faction. We can see this um, if we look at, for example, we're probably going to have to go into the family tree. Um, and yeah, we've got it here. So we've got the faction of Dong Zhuo, which takes his name because he's the ruling warlord. The same for Liu Chong, the same for Liu Dai, Tai Chen, and Yuan Shao. So... All of these guys, basically their factions are named after them because nobody, as of yet, is a Dukey. Um, as you become, as you reach the rank of Duke, your faction will take on the the name of that particular Dukey. It can be, if it's one of the unique factions, um, it can. it's usually a unique name. For example, Cao Cao would be the Dukey of Wei or the King of Wei. Um, if it's Yuan Shao, for example, it would be the Kingdom of Song or the Duke of Song. Um, for, for the less unique factions, for example, we just saw New Dai. Um, it typically takes the name of their capital province. So to give you a bit of information on that, um, at the minute we've got Shen. It's got this star here, which tells us it's a faction capital. Now, if we weren't a unique faction, if we weren't Cao Cao, if we were somebody less important, like... Um, you die, important to the story that would be, then we would, once we become a Juki, we would just get the name of our capital, which his at the minute is Ying Chuan. So he would be the Juki of Ying Chuan, etc. Um, I think that's also why, for anyone who has played previous Total War games, you used to be able to name your settlements. It's a working theory that I've got that the reason they took that out is so that this mechanic would actually work. If you could put a custom name in there, it may not work as well. Um, though I'm, I'm not sure if that's why they took it out. I'm kind of 
disappointed that they did, but we'll save that for another video. Um, so we've uh, we've gone through the faction name. We've got the faction rank, which is noble. We've just been speaking about. We've got zero years of rule because we haven't even completed turn one yet. And we've got here a list of different buffs and debuffs that we're receiving at the minute. So we've got satisfaction balanced. Satisfaction within your faction is in a state of relative balance all as well. This is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But we do tend to get more buffs or um, a better overall um, a better overall health for our faction if our generals are satisfied. To give you an idea of how that works, and we will go into this in much more detail later on, but you've got here all of your characters, which you can either press the uh, control and F2, which will bring up the character panel, or you can just click the panel on the side here under characters. That will tell you all of the characters that are currently in your faction. So you've got here characters, general and general. The reason they're separated is because these two guys are on the field. We've got them there in that army. The other guys are characters at court. Guys and girls, I should say, as well, because uh, Lady Bian's there. Um... Characters of court are useful for various different things. It basically means that they're sitting around doing nothing. Um, we'll go into a little bit more of what you can do with them when we get to discussing characters more in depth. But for the time being, all you need to pay attention to is this on the right-hand side, the little face, uh, which will give you a good indication, actually, if you just look at it. You've got a happy face there in green. The other faces are kind of neutral. They're like, meh. They, they don't really, they're not happy or, or unhappy. Um, like I said, there's nothing wrong with that, um, but ideally you want everyone to have that nice happy green face and you do tend to get some buffs from that. So um, the food is ample at the minute because we've got a surplus of two, as we discussed in the previous screen, um, which has given us these buffs to uh, peasantry income and reserves. We've, uh, we've already covered basically everything about food other than diplomacy, which again we'll go into a little bit more later on. Um, this side, uh, or this... This uh, widget is credibility. At the minute, it's admirable. So the credibility, again, is uh, Cao Cao's unique faction mechanic. Um, we will recover plus two per turn, and it's used to manipulate diplomatic attitude between factions and can also be used to trigger proxy wars. Um, and it says underneath there, you are reputed for your honesty and conviction. Your counsel is heard and strongly considered. Now, the, uh, the credibility, as we discussed previously, is here. And that's basically telling you that you will recover plus three in that bracket. If you see the little black line there, you'll recover plus two there. And in the top bracket, you'll only As recover I plus one per turn. Town sounds getting a little bit future. impatient there, so uh, he keeps piping up. Um, the last thing is your, your title and your prestige. And it's telling you that you're a noble, and it's telling you the sorts of things that you get for being a noble. Once we increase the second Marcus, that'll be up there, the same for Marcus Jew, etc. Uh, this is our population. So population is useful for tax revenue. The more citizens you've got paying taxes, the more tax revenue you receive. And it also helps with replenishment as well. So replenishment is basically when you're in a battle, and we will show this after we fight these guys, um, though I don't really anticipate losing too many units. Um, the replenishment is essentially how fast you regain soldiers after they're injured or killed. Um, again, it's probably best to investigate that a bit more after we've had a battle. We'll make sure that we incur some casualties just so we can show that off. Um, that's really all that population is useful for. If you have a population that's too high in a fairly small settlement or with a fairly small city, which we'll go into again when we get um, into the buildings and, and the types of buildings you want, then it can mean that you get a negative public order debuff from that so it's worth watching that but again it's it's going to be much easier to discuss that once we discuss buildings um this is our commanderies so commanderies are like counties or provinces at the minute we have one and it is chen as we've discussed we actually only have uh one portion of the or one county within the shen province so if we click on chen you can see here we've got three buildings again we're not getting into buildings just now but this is sunya uh Suiyang, I believe. Um, I'm probably butchering these pronunciations and I apologise, but Chinese just does not work very well with my accent. But I'll do my best. Um, likewise, if anyone would like to correct any of my pronunciations, you're more than welcome to in the comments and I would appreciate it because I am trying to get them right. Um, we've got here Suiyang and then as well in Chen, if you look, we've got two other little counties there, which is Pengxian and Ruyang. Uh, if we click on... Pensiang, it'll take us over here, and that's to show you that this is 
where the where the settlement is or where the uh, the smaller county is. And again, the same with Ruyang. Now, if we were to take all three of them, we would have undisputed ownership of this commandery, of Chen commandery. Um, we still have it tallied as one because we've got one settlement within that commandery and it's the capital. So the way that tends to work is you have one big city, in this case it's Suyang, and you've got two smaller cities which are usually specialised. That's a livestock farm and that's farmland. Um, again, it's going to be much better to discuss that when we get into buildings, but that's what that little icon means there essentially. It just tells you how many commanders you currently own. Now, uh, we've already been through gold and treasury. We've been through food. This here is your reforms. That's your tech reforms. Now, the, the reform tree, the tech tree, if you will, is one of my favorite features in this game, which might sound a little bit weird, but I am going to show you it in a minute. Now, uh, at the minute, we've only got one because we've only just started the game. The tech tree is up here. You can either click on that or you can press the number four and that will bring the tech tree. Now, as you progress through the tech tree, you'll see here, you've got a nice blooming, um, we will call them cherry blossoms. I believe in Chinese, they're, they're referred to as peach blossoms. Um, but as you select a tech reform, which give you various buffs and unlock different buildings and things like that, we will discuss this in much more detail later on, um, the, the tree will start to bloom. And as you get to the end of the game, you'll have a lovely, nice, big blooming peach blossom tree um, for you to look at and be proud of your work. Um, it's it, it's it's a subtle thing, but I really really like this. Um, I really like this tech tree. Um, it just looks really pretty when it's all bloomed up. So that's something that I enjoyed. I hope you enjoy it too. <laughs> Maybe not as much as me, um, but I'm partial to those kind of things. Um, so we've got there the uh, the reforms, and underneath that we've got ancillaries. Now at the minute we've got 51 ancillaries. Ancillaries are essentially items. We are going to go through these in much more detail individually. These are just trying to show you what each individual widget means. But if we look down here, we've got ancillaries gained. At the start of your campaign, you'll be given a list of items that you get to start off with, essentially. And these do tend to still scale with the difficulty. So if you're on a harder difficulty, you'll get less ancillaries and probably less useful ancillaries to start with. And you'll have to go and acquire them yourself as you decrease the difficulty at the minute for example we're on normal you tend to start with some decent ones so at the minute we've got an architect gives us plus six expertise plus six resolve and minus five construction cost in the administrative commandery we've also got a represent representational representationist yeah that's right i had a bit of trouble with that so it's not just chinese words i can't can't pronounce it's english ones as well represent representationist representationist yeah there we go that's that's a weird word i'm skeptical as to whether that's an actual word but never mind we got one of them plus 15 cunning that's very very good um and plus 10 percent trade influence if the character's prime minister uh or faction leader and the trader gives us plus two cunning and gives us the assignment surplus markets plus five trade influence a lot of these effects and everything are things that we're gonna have to discuss in more detail as we go on but these are ancillaries essentially. They're all followers. If we go into uh, Sao Sao's character panel, panel, which you can do by the way by just right clicking on the character that you want to discuss, you'll see his sword. That is also an ancillary. So we could remove that from him and give it to somebody else if we wanted to. Um, his, his armor is actually bound and you can see that by this little um, icon here. It's like a little lion or a little dragon. Basically says it's bound to that character and can't be swapped. So uh, this is quite common with unique armors. I believe, yeah, Xiaohu Dun has it as well. Um, and I think Xiaohu Yan, yeah, he does. So most unique characters will have bound armor, but they won't have bound weapons. If we go into Cao Ren, for example, he is a generic general. Um, even though he has quite a big part to play in the story, but uh, in the game, he's a generic general. His armor does not have that little uh, symbol on it saying that it's bound. So we can swap that out with any other armor that we have that's applicable to his class. And it'll change his appearance as well. So there is some degree of customization there, which is pretty cool. Um, again, something we'll go into in more detail later on. Um, for the time being, the uh, all you need to know is that this represents the number of ancillaries that you have in your faction. That can be weapons, armor, followers, accessories, whatever the case may be. We've got a stone pig there, which we can give him for some buffs as well. The purpose of ancillaries is to buff your generals, make them a little bit better, more effective, uh, possibly give you faction bonuses, all kinds of different things. Um, way too much to get into in this introduction. But we got 51 of them all together. That includes... Um, ones that we have equipped to characters 
and ones that we have um, available to use as well. So um, this one here is armies, which tells us at the minute we've got one army. That's the one that we've got right there with Cao Cao in it. Uh, this is ministers. We've got no ministers at the minute. That's because if we go into our court, which you can either press the number two or you can just click up there. We don't have any uh, positions unlocked other than chancellor at the minute and we haven't appointed anyone. This is something we'll go into a bit more detail as well later on. Now, here we've got administrators. That's another function of the court. We've been over administrators a little bit like governors. Uh, assignments, we'll cover this in more detail in the next episode as well. And the spies, again, that's going to require quite a bit of uh, explanation, I think, in terms of the way the spy system works on this game. Here we've got the uh, allies that we currently have. We don't have any. The vassals that we currently have, we don't have any. And trade agreements, we don't have any. But we do have three enemies. we got Yellow Turban Rebellion, Han Empire, and Dong Zhuo. So that will tell you basically your diplomatic standing and uh, what's going on with you and the other factions in the game. If we go to statistics, you can see here that we've got the current turn, years elapsed, notable characters, and you've got the uh, different characters, that total active characters that you've got. It's just basically as it sounds. It's literally just all of the stats that you could possibly wonder about for your faction. It'll just tell you everything you want to know if you ever want to... Uh, if you're chasing possibly an achievement or you just want to know how you're doing, you can see it over there. So we'll uh, we'll close that. And um, the next thing we're going to do is start a battle with these guys. Um, that is going to be in the next episode because we're going to try and keep these episodes a little bit shorter, um, a little bit more concise and, and to the point so that if people are looking for a particular part of a tutorial, it's a little bit easier. Um, so we'll end this one here and I hope to see you in episode two. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Totem War Three Kingdoms Beginner's Guide. If you found the video to be enjoyable or helpful, hit the like button. It lets YouTube know that this video is worth showing to other people too. And if you'd like to see more of this content, please subscribe. To learn more about the incredible characters and story that this game is based upon, you can check out my lore series. And if you'd like to see me fight desperately for survival against a relentless AI, check out my legendary difficulty Let's Play series. Thanks again, and I hope to see you again next time.